Hello, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Rethinking the A to Z of Cell Therapy Manufacturing, brought to you in partnership with Sexton Biotechnologies. Um, for those of you who don't know me, hi, uh, I'm Augajata. I'm the head of content here at Facilitate and I will be your webinar host today. Um, today we're talking about automation and creating true end-to-end -end processing. We have three wonderful speakers lined up for you today. Uh, Priya Biraniak at Organa Bio will take the first speaking slot uh, to talk about what end-to-end -end solutions to manufacturing and supply chain they've created at Organa Bio. Um, then David Smith will talk to us about historical opportunities at Ori Biotech for process and handling materials, the improvements that are still needed, and where future opportunities exist. And then finally, Stephen Thompson at Sexton will speak about how Sextons have, have captured the need for flexibility and customization in manufacturing in the Signata CT5 as a fluid handling system. Um, a quick reminder that this is an interactive session, so all questions are very much encouraged. Uh, to submit something, please use the question function on your control panel, and we will address these at the end of the three presentations. We've reserved 15 minutes at least for uh, questions and answers uh, at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand straight over to our first speaker. So uh, Priya, take it away. Thank you, Lanka Zata. All right, so thank you everyone. It is my pleasure today to um, introduce today's webinar on manufacturing processes and considerations for developing a robust manufacturing process. And I'd like to talk to you about how we at OrganaBio think about manufacturing short-term and long-term so that we can best support our customers and, and partners on their path to clinical translation and commercialization. Could you advance the slide, please? So to build a successful manufacturing pro program for your cell therapy, you have to first start with building a robust supply chain. But there are many, many considerations, including regulatory requirements, how do you establish a robust and reproducible process and move from process development to actual clinical manufacturing, and what are the in-process parameters and critical quality attributes that you need to think about in order to have a robust and reproducible product that meets your target product profile at the end of the day. And then thinking about scale up and scale out, and especially in the context of automation, what are some of the considerations on how to lay that technology roadmap and the questions around when to automate and how to automate. So some of these elements that I'll be touching upon, introducing, and then handing off to David and Stephen to speak about some more. Could you please advance the, to the next slide? Thank you. So cell-based products are highly complex and the manufacturing process obviously consists of multiple unit operations. Oftentimes we're not only talking about living cells that are needing, needed for cell therapy or to generate cell-produced products, but sometimes we also are combining these with genetic constructs, um, genetically modifying cells, we're combining them with scaffolds and other substances or substrates to uh, develop our final therapeutic product. And so there are many, many unit operations that must come together, all the way from tissue procurement and cell isolation through expansion, manipulation, downstream isolation and purification processes and final fill finish. And so there's really a lot of nodes for complexity, a lot of nodes for variability, and therefore a lot of inherent risk in cell therapy manufacturing. And these processes today are highly manual and labor intensive, and it takes a team of highly trained individuals to execute all of these various elements to produce a cell or cell-based therapy. And when we think about the success of our cell therapy programs, we often equate success with quantity, the lot size that we can manufacture, how quickly we can manufacture that product. But really um, what we need to think about for a truly successful manufacturing process is the quality of that process at the end of the day. And we can't sacrifice quality to generate large lots of materials. We have to make sure that the quality is there not only from a final product perspective, but again, from a one manufacturing run to the next manufacturing run perspective as well, the robustness and the reproducibility. 
Next slide, please. So we know that manufacturing is actually an iterative process, right? We have raw material sourcing, we have process development, which itself is highly iterative in thinking about what is the platform that we want to use to get to first in man clinical trials? How do we scale that out? How do we account for moving through phases of clinical trials, dose escalation, number of units that we have to manufacture to meet the patient lot size or the clinical trial lot size? go to market commercial lot size and final full commercial scale manufacturing. These are all questions that have to be addressed in process development. And eventually, once you have a process that is locked in, you move that over to manufacturing. But as we all know, these are, these are processes where it's a little bit of chicken and egg, right? Do I get to first in man and then figure out how I scale? Or do I have my whole technology roadmap in place and then get to first in man? And often the way we do this is this back and forth process between manufacturing and process development. And late stage process changes, raw materials changes are very costly and can really derail programs. So it's very important early on to at least have a sense of how you want your process and your manufacturing program to grow through the various stages of your program and of your corporate strategy. Next program, next slide please. So let's start with the first two considerations, supply chain and regulatory requirements. Next slide. So lot to lot variability is really the biggest issue here when we're looking at robustness and reproducibility. We have inherent biologic variability when it comes to a cell product, as we all know. There's inherent donor variability, which is the largest variable that we must account for. But then tissue and cell variability is also something that we have to deal with. And we're in a very exciting field. It's rapidly expanding, it's burgeoning. Every month we hear about advances that are just astounding. But really what this means is that we're in a new industry, we're moving into uncharted territory every day. And so there's really no gold standard for the industry in terms of how we standardize materials, testing, release, how we also characterize these products. And therefore, documentation practices are highly variable. The C of A's that we get from one supplier versus another are very, very different. And there's no harmonization even in our terminology oftentimes. What is xeno-free or serum-free to one is not necessarily the same definition of xeno-free and serum-free for another. So it's very important to understand in your supply chain what your suppliers vernacular is, what their definitions are of terminology, as well as their philosophy in managing materials testing, release, characterization, and documentation. And when we look at the manufacturing process itself, there are a number of variables there. So not only the input in terms of the raw materials, but from one operator to the next, there can be a high degree of variability. And if you're looking at a decentralized manufacturing process as well, where perhaps you're manufacturing at multiple clinical sites or using multiple contract manufacturing organizations, you also have differences between the various sites. And this is where automation can lend itself to, again, driving reproducibility in your process by eliminating some of these variables. Next slide. So consider things you should consider in building a very robust supply chain. The quality, the control, and the redundancy in your chain are absolutely vital. So using defined media or synthetic or engineered substrates can again minimize variability. So anywhere where you have a highly defined product that meets a set specification every time will help you in decreasing variability. You should also look for partners who, as I said, share your philosophy in terms of the importance of quality control, assay development, characterization and testing, as well as documentation practices and systems. So this means that not only do they have the documentation to meet you where you are today, but they have the documentation, the processes and the protocols in place to grow with you and to meet you where you ultimately want to go, which in our case is CGMP manufacturing. And so a supplier who can provide you with only RUO materials, RUO donors, and only provide you with documentation for research use product ultimately is not going to be the right long-term partner. So you want to search for a partner who can take you into CGMP, 
understands good documentation practices, good, good manufacturing practices, and has all of the support structures in place, including the way that they perform their informed consents for their donor pools and manage the ethics of donor recruitment, qualification, and tissue collection. Very, very important in our space. And also look at whether your suppliers have a plan for scalability and automation. Because if your goal ultimately is to scale and automate, you want to make sure that your suppliers can provide you with the right quantity of materials produced the right way and in a format that you can plug into your manufacturing platform and systems. Keeping all of this on the horizon will really preclude any surprises and lead to those late stage raw material or process changes. So when we look at establishing a robust and reproducible process, again, process development is vital and taking a quality by design approach to process development, thinking about the target product profile and then designing your experimental space and your process development program to drive towards that tra target product profile is absolutely critical. It's also important to identify the in-process parameters or the critical process parameters that will allow you to know if your process is working every time. Oftentimes our cell manufacturing processes take weeks to take from start to completion. And having to wait several weeks after the final product is manufactured to even know if the process worked in, introduces a lot of risk into our programs. So having in-process parameters that can be asset, assayed in real time to give you a sense of whether that final product is going to meet your critical quality attributes is paramount to sustained success. And again, this is where automated systems with sensors with non-destructive, minimally invasive real-time sensing can really move the needle on our manufacturing processes. The last thing to keep in mind is that because these are multi-unit operations, we often have specified teams or personnel who are focused on one unit operation versus the process as a whole. And so it's very important to make sure that all of your COGS work together. Your cost of goods for one process cannot outweigh the cost of goods or one unit operation cannot derail the cost of goods for your entire cell therapy manufacturing program. But also your teams have to work together, always see the forest from the trees and make sure that what they're doing is understood by the other, other teammates, other um, people in charge of other unit operations and that all these operations can continue to work together synchronously and grow synchronously. So when we're thinking about robustness, reproducibility, and those critical quality attributes of the final product, again, utilizing equipment and software that can drive efficiency, that can give you real-time outputs along the path to your final product can really help alleviate and mitigate some of the risk that's involved in the manufacturing process. And then again, we really have to establish this, these critical quality attributes. Oftentimes we wait till later stage clinical trials to really say, what is my potency assay going to be? Or how am I going to say that my final product works or is the same every time? The earlier you can answer those questions, the better off you are. And knowing what pieces you will do in house and which elements you will have to outsource is equally critical because transfer of processes and transfer of assays, tech transfer, is a lengthy process and actually has a lot of risk involved with it, just in and of itself. You wanna make sure that your process, like I said, is really ready for, for tech transfer, whether that's internal tech transfer or tech transfer to a third party, CRO, CTO, or CDMO. You wanna de develop procedures and protocols that ensure consistency between your manufacturing runs. This goes all the way from training your staff on procedures and protocols through good documentation practices to then looking critically at deviations, putting into place CAPAs, and knowing how that process development workflow moves from PD into manufacturing. This is especially important when you're tech transferring to a third party to make sure that there is enough detail in your batch records that it can be done um, that the process can be performed by someone else. And again, having automation may alleviate some of those issues of having to train operators, whether it's within your own company or at a third party partner. So think CMC early on. The earlier you can have the elements of your CMC section in place, the better off you are. 
And finally, when we look at scale up and automation, truly the question is not to automate or not to automate, but really when and how should we automate? So we have these multiple unit operations that must come together, and we have a, a number of means by which we can address automation at the end of the day. Do we automate individual unit operations or do we look for a, an automated system that's comprehensive, that goes all the way from the start of the process through the end of the process? And for each manufacturing process, that's something that you have to really interrogate. Does it make sense to operate all at once and put everything into one box, if you will? Or does it make sense to have multiple unit operations that are automated individually, but can work together in synchrony? And then how do you move from one automated unit operation to the next is a, a very important question in making sure that it all comes together. You can also automate in a, in a phased approach if you take that unit operation automation approach. So automation can really bring scalability and consistency to your process while decreasing the variability time and labor needed. However, you've got to really think about the pros and cons of automation and when it makes sense to do so. There can be a prohibitive cost of goods if you automate too early versus the labor required to perhaps refine the process or make small adjustments to the process that a human operator may be able to do. You also have to think about automating too late as well, especially if it comes to tech transfer, or if it comes to lot sizes and those critical process changes that can be costly. So there's really a Goldilocks zone in determining when's the right time to operate to gain the utmost benefit. And if you're going to operate in a phased manner with multi, multiple unit operations, how do you make sure that that modular approach can all come together, work together and grow together to get to fully integrated modules and manufacturing systems from start to finish? So in conclusion, to build a robust and successful manufacturing process, early on you must secure a robust supply chain and put into place partners who have similar philosophies and can work with you not only today, but grow with you and your program to perform you, to provide you the platforms and solutions that you need all along your path to manufacturing and commercialization. Develop a process that's based on your final product specs, know the regulatory requirements, and always keep CMC in mind as you move through process development into manufacturing. And Ultimately, you always want to drive institutional discipline, rigor, and compliance. And so again, this is where automation and automated processes can add a lot of, um, a lot of uh, good benefits to your system in terms of the robustness, the reproducibility, and minimizing variability. But you really have to think about timing and how best you identify and mitigate risk. So at Organabio, we really look at that end-to-end -end solution and how do we go all the way from donor procurement and supply chain robustness for our customers and partners through GMP manufacturing solutions. And we're listening actively to our customers on their needs along this path from not only raw materials to process development to the manufacturing itself, but also what platforms and systems they need in order to scale their programs with or without automation. So with that, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to, to speak today. A reminder that any questions for me can be put into the chat box. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dave. Thanks, Priya. That was a, a great run through. Um, a, a lot of information on those slides for everyone to, to take on board and take in. Uh, I think as you, um, Look to this sort of next presentation that I'm going to go through is a lot of the, the same stories are going to be in there um, and hopefully build on those to really stress, you know, the point that um, Priya made there that automation isn't questionable. It's all about when and how. Um, we know there's tremendous value in being able to go there. Um, so, you know, it's kind of an, another summary slide, um, but I think it really sets the scene well. A lot of what sort of Priya said um, around we have huge scalability issues. We have really crippling consistency issues. You know, not all the variation there is inherent. We often will preach that there's so much biological variation 
you know, what chance do we have? But the reality is, yes, there is. But there's also a number of uh, boxes of variation that we can control um, a lot better. Uh, and automation can help us get there. Um, I think, you know, without going through all of these, um, I'll try and sort of come back to all of them throughout this presentation to look at how do we make it less complex? You know, how do we decide what is the best approach given the phase that we're in? Um, you know, how do we get away from the manual processing, the error prone labor will come up in every single conference, every single meeting. Of, there's nobody out there, they cost a lot and they're still error prone because they are human. Um, so it makes it um, a real tricky, a real tricky one. Um, so on the next slide, uh, instead of it's not just sort of me and Priya saying this, there's a real um, new advanced slide. Oh, sorry, yeah. uh, go back one, that's it, perfect. Um, so it's not, it's not just me and Priya um, talking about um, the problems there. It is real sort of flexibility, scalability issue across the whole of this industry. Um, so there's a number of companies that I'm sure we're all familiar with here on here. Uh, and this isn't a case of, you know, pinning these companies and saying they've done it wrong, 100% they haven't. These are the pioneers of our industry that are trying to tackle what is an incredibly complex uh, a problem that not one company is going to be able to solve. It's going to take uh, an army, uh, in our case, probably the entire industry working together to figure this out. Um, and, you know, pre stress sort of CMC being uh, key to this um, and, how we sort of advance through, how we think about these early enough um, that we can make a difference and make sure that we do have a, a successful product. Some of the sort of problems that our customers are facing um, and what we've sort of whittled it down to onto the next slide is around sort of, you know, the scalability we've mentioned. Um, how do we go from a, an R&D setting so we can go on to the next slide. How do we go from an R&D setting through our clinical trials and into commercial? Priya said the cost of changing raw materials, changing technology, adopting new technology is huge. Um, and it becomes a, a large barrier to this industry. So how can we take something that we're doing at bench scale in an R&D setting, get that into the clinical trial and get that into the commercial uh, setting and not have to change everything in there. And that's sort of the industry that we sit in today is that the scalability, the consistency, all of these things change through those three different paradigms. So how do we go all the way through without having to change everything every time we do? We do so much great work at R&D, and then we go into a clinical trial and we have to change it a bit um, because it doesn't quite fit our needs. And then we go, oh, no, we need to do commercial scale version of it. We need to change it all again. It really undoes sort of all the hard work that we started off doing. And, just extends the timelines and the cost that we're going through. Um, high cost and lead time to establish in-house manufacturing. Um, you know, the large sites, you need commercial scale in mind, but you don't need necessarily need it today. How do you balance that act? How do you deal with sort of the idle capacity concept? You know, the utilization of CMOs um, versus in-house and things is a huge debate um, that we can get into. Lack of flexibility. Um, you know, this idea that you spend all this money and time developing your process and then you go to look for automation out there and there's nothing really that quite fits. You take the best of what it is and adapt your process. 100% the wrong way around. We need to be flipping that model and saying, we've developed this process. Now we need to adapt our technology to fit the process that we've got. That process is defined because it's the best for ourselves, it's the best for the patients. Uh, we can't be limited to sort of what's on the shelf out there to make sure it fits into um our process um if, if you are using third parties you know how do you keep eyes on the process and it really goes to that last bullet point of how do we get visibility and insights into the manufacturing and not only from a control viewpoint how do we prove to the regulators that we're in control but also you know, if you are a third party how do you give your your customer 
um, the knowledge that they need? And even further, how do you give the patient? Uh, if you're a patient, maybe you want to be able to see how well your sales are doing through the process. Yes, there's a limit to how much you give, but that could be a great pick-me-up that some of these extremely sick patients need. Oh, my sales have just left the manufacturing site. They're with the logistics company. That's great news. You know, in one, two days, I'm going to be getting them. Um, how do we embed that into the process as we're looking? Um, reducing the expensive manufacturing infrastructure, which links to that high capital cost, and then coming back to people. You see this throughout. Um, you know, how do we reduce those error rates down? On to the next slide, you'll see sort of Ori's approach. Um, so we've got the, the biology piece, um, and that's the piece that, um, you know, I think it, as an industry we've been working on, the clinical efficacy is there, working hard. It's not a done deal sort of thing, but, you know, we know a lot more than we did, say, sort of five years ago here. But there's still sort of room for improvement. But the real thing that Ori is trying to bring is in these two other buckets of engineering and data. So yes, you've got the biology, you can grow sales, that's great. But how do we now automate that? How do we now scale that? How do we bring in the consistency? And that's where these three areas now need to gel. Um, and so you can't take one of these and be successful. You can't take biology in a silo and be successful because we'll be doing everything in a test tube. You can't take engineering and design everything perfectly because you're probably not going to set grow great cells. And so it's really coming together. And then the data piece, we are hungry for data. There's so much out there that we need to be utilizing to then feed back into the engineering and the biology to make sure we are producing a consistent product of the highest quality that's needed. Um, and so where we fit is really bringing these three pieces together into that middle piece to say, okay, we need an automatic sort of platform system with real-time data collection that's driving uh, the industry forward. So in the next slide, you know, I think I'm ready to automate, but how do I know? You know, I think Priya mentioned sort of QBD. That's a great backbone to start off with. Right? Do you know your CQAs? Do you know your... QTPPs, your CPPs, all of these parameters. It's really hard to build technology, evaluate technology if you don't really know what you need it to do. Um, and so that's sort of the lowest bar is just going down that route. And then you start sort of linking in some of the other ones that I put here, build or buy. Um, you know, is there an off-the-shelf solution? Is there an off-the-shelf solution that maybe just needs a bit of development, working with the technology providers to say, it's great, it goes down to 50 mLs. I really want to get to 30 mLs. Is that possible? What is, what is, and what am I looking at? Where's the trade off to get down there? Um, or do I just go and develop something all myself? Um, you know, understanding that isn't a quick route and it's definitely not a cheap route. Um, modular all in one. Uh, I think Stephen will come on to this one a little bit later. Um, you know, there's a gut feeling of do you know what you need? Um, does today sort of representative of what you're going to need in two three four years time if it is then all in one might be the perfect solution for that um, that you're not going to change anything you don't need the flexibility um, to sort of swap in and out modules as the technology grows or changes you might be locked in it could be a great way to go um, but there's a number of things to think about around efficiency business case throughput um, you know you'll hear a lot the ratio of equipment to each other you know if you're in a a bioreactor for 10 days you're in a separation device for 30 minutes is the relationship one-to-one -one, or can you get away with you know 30 bioreactors that have been serviced from one separation you know, can you really think about how you increase the effectiveness the efficiency of your manufacturing space in there supply chain the biggest issue in this industry right now getting our hands on consumables and media and things as this industry has burst into life, and especially at the commercial scale now, um, we're in really short supply of a lot of these things. Picking a provider that can show you the roadmap, show you how they're gonna deal with that is instrumental. You know, it's the supplies of the supplies of the suppliers going all the way back. It's hard work um, to sort of track that, but what can sort of the people that you're buying from give you as a guarantee that you're not going to run out mid-clinical trial or um, mid-commercial. 
flexibility with standardization. This is a, it's one of my favorite phrases at the moment and seems a sort of oxymoron that how, how can you be flexible and standardized? It's exactly what this industry needs to do. We don't have standardization and standardization doesn't necessarily mean doing the same thing every single time. It's going back to sort of the QBD, the design space. You can be flexible within your design space and still standardized. So how do we do that? How do you, you know, there's going to be process changes. There's going to be biological variation, but we need to work within that. Um, so what products on the market allow that? Um, and even looking um, outside of the, the country you're operating in today, you know, do you have plans and ambitions to go to other markets, to the US, to Europe, to Asia? Is automation available there? Can you pick up a piece of equipment in the US and also utilize it in um, Asia? Um, things to think about. Then scalability, um, I mentioned before, and I went to this idea of how do you go from process development all the way through to commercial without changing every step of the way. Um, and then strategy, as a company, if you're deciding to automate, what is your, what's the end goal of your company? Um, you know, are you looking to incorporate technology as a core part of your company? Then you may say, I'm going to go build it rather than buy it because I want the IP around it, I want to be able to sell it. You know, there's a couple of companies out there that have both um, a cell therapy as well as a technology. You know, they're two very different business models. They can be hard to bring together, but it is possible. Um, and not necessarily what you're looking today, but maybe looking forward as well. What does your pipeline look like? That may sort of really have an effect as to whether you're ready to automate and which parts you're ready to automate. So on the next slide, you know, a lot of what we talk about is automation in the clean room, um, but there's a lot more automation that can be done. And some which is a lot more sort of standardized. We need to be going all the way from sort of sensors within, you know, measuring the cells, bringing that together into data, populating that into systems. You've obviously got this quality oversight and all the way back to the patient. Um, and it, it's not an easy thing. Uh, I think until we, really get full integration um, shown on the next slide that's not really going to be possible right and so we start a lot about automating at the equipment level in the clean room but there's other automation systems that we can get to as well um, so on the next slide you'll see and i just put some as an example to show the the complexity that we're dealing with here and why you know we need to be working together to do this that there's a number of systems that we need to have in place and uh, really talking to each other to really fully utilize the power of automation and the ability to get the consistency um, to really advance the manufacturing process. You know, to get your MES system that people see the heart, but that's got to talk to your limbs, it's got to talk to your EMS. You've got the analytics flying out of that, you've got track and trace coming in and talking to it. How are you scheduling people, equipment, clean rooms? Um, there's a number of different systems to think about there um, as we do that. So on the next slide, you see sort of the, the vision that Ori is going down, this idea of, yep, you can have a system, you can start intensifying manufacturing um, by thinking the right way about how we scale this up. And um, when you get into this, you know, thousand doses, per thousand square feet I mean, that's three to four times what we're capable of doing today just by rethinking there's nothing in this model there's nothing um different to how you're doing it today apart from a piece of already technology in there right we've still got class b we've still got hoods there's still tremendous needs around all of that in terms of how do we close some of the the cytokine delivery how do we close a system around the viral addition or your RNA addition or something, right? But still within the constraints of that and not solving everything, we can still intensify manufacturing hugely. And then there's a vision to then take this even further, go to a completely closed system, knock down that wall. Now how many patients can you get per thousand square foot? Really goes through the roof. Um, and so you know looking at sort of this scalable infrastructure as well as a way to move forward you don't need a ginormous facility for your phase one you do for commercial but you know there's a three four years difference between that so can you start small and just bolt on add on as you go through um this is really getting to this idea of what you do at r d can just be replicated 
maybe numerous times in a, a pod-like system like this for commercial operation. So just two more slides. Um, and so on the next one, you know, this idea of moving from the status quo a very open, very manual, requiring skilled workforce, expensive facilities, manual steps, manual, you know, support involves around QA batch release to now, how do we reduce the, the number of workforce? How do we reduce the facility? Um, how do we now do automated fluid handling? Um, and then QA and QC by extension. So looking at MES systems, looking at a, a Q quality management system that can allow that to really now get into that top right corner to scale to where we need to get to in order to reach the patients that need our help the most. So in summary of all of that uh, on the last slide here, you know, I mentioned sort of a lack of scalability. So now let's really intensify the manufacturing process and get more products per year in the same manufacturing process and workflow. That's going to bring down your cost significant. That's going to let us get out to more people. Um, you know, thinking about your manufacturing capacity, is there other models here? Can you purchase? Can you lease manufacturing space? There's a number of companies out there now, sort of more hotel style clean room. Maybe that's great to start off with in your phase one, phase two, um, when you don't need much space. And so really thinking through the best way of sorting out manufacturing, keeping the flexibility, you know, one product that can be utilized throughout your scale, um, one piece of technology. Um, and then looking at how you reduce the labor, keep on going back to labor, it's a real problem. And then how do you get more data, you know, pre-integrated manufacturing systems. So if you can imagine now a box that's got everything in it you need, got all the systems, real turnkey manufacturing solution where all it needs is your product. You know, this is novel for this industry. It's very different for this industry, but not for other industries. You know, there may be a, if you want to manufacture something, you put it on a manufacturing line, look at the biologics. You're not going to go in with your own equipment and do everything from a, a blank sheet of paper. Most of the system's there, and there's a little bit of tinkering to just make it specific for you. And that's sort of the idea that we need to be getting to with sort of a more turnkey manufacturing. You don't lose um, control of it, and you don't lose flexibility. You still have all of those, um, but at least within a turnkey manufacturing. And so with that, I will end. Um, like with Priya, if there's any questions, please uh, put them in the box, and I'll hand over to Stephen. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks, Priya. Um, two really excellent presentations that I think really highlight the, the challenges we face as an industry. Um, I'd like to follow on, uh, talk to you a little bit about um, how Sexton is interpreting these challenges that we face. Um, on, a little bit about some of the tools and technologies that we're developing um, to try and address some of those unmet needs. So next slide, please. So just a little bit of background about Sexton. Um, we're a spin-out from Incubator Accelerator Hub uh, Cochrane Gentech. We spun out back in October 2019. Uh, we took with us some tools and technologies that we developed over the, the past five years. Um, the Sexton, what we're really attempting to do now is uh, apply these existing tools as well as further develop new technologies to reduce variability across the cell therapy manufacturing process. Well, really, we want to do this in a way that incorporates standardization, but maintains that level of flexibility. And with this in mind, rather than create technologies that work perfectly for a single therapy developer, but force others to adapt their manufacturing process um, in order to fit within the, the confines of that given technology. We're trying to develop tools that meet industry processing needs and therefore can be incorporated into the majority of cell therapy processes. Next slide, please. So, as we all know, translating processes from academic research and development towards scale GMP and manufacturing, there's a, a lot of considerations that need to be made. And as Priya mentioned in her presentation, Taking a quality by design approach to process development allows you to begin with that target product profile and then work through all those input materials and process steps and address any potential pitfalls that, that might arise. Um, so things such as, you know, are all the required materials available in GMP compliant forms? Are they available in sufficient supply both today and based on demand at scale in several years time? 
can we move away from those variable manual processes and towards um, automated platforms? And if we do that, what monitoring control must we, we look to implement to ensure that we, we capture all those critical process parameters and that the, the process itself doesn't deviate from those defined specifications? And I think whilst each therapy developer will likely have their own specific needs within such challenges, as tools providers, I think it's really key that we develop technologies with that flexibility to address each of these individual needs with a, an industry-wide solution. I think as Dave mentioned there, um, you know, I think historically what has happened is the processes have had to adapt um, to fit within automation. And I think we do really need to flip that. Next slide, please. Because really ultimately at the most sort of basic level, um, what most self-therapy manufacturing processes are aiming to do, and especially in the autologous space, is take something that is inherently variable, like a start material, and then through a series of stepwise process operations, reduce that variability to a point where the therapeutic output is uh, a consistent and safe um, and efficacious product. Next slide, please. But one of the, the fundamental challenges is, and uh, again, particularly in the autologous setting, is that the, the input material is so highly variable. And with the patient very likely a relapsed or refractory patient who's been through multiple rounds of radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And so it becomes very difficult to lock down the process to the point where each manufacturing one is exactly the same each time. And um, certainly the use of time as a standardized parameter within manufacturing processes is almost impossible and um, cells grow at very different rates and um, so being able to define something like harvesting cells at day five you're going to end up with highly variable cell numbers across those different processes and so whilst building a standardized process is is really fundamental to reducing variability of the final product it's really key the flexibility is also built into the manufacturing design and so whilst there might be a, a linear series of unit operations and so processing of the start material, cell selection, activation, transduction, cell expansion before final um, formulation, fill and, and maybe cryopreservation, the way in which the material moves through this manufacturing process is, is flexible and the decision to take that next step must really be based around in process data um, rather than predefined processes which use variables such as time as the, the overarching process control. And this is really what we see as the goal for flexible automation. Next slide, please. So it really is looking at a manufacturing process and determining which unit operations should be incorporated to advance the product and actively reduce variability and which tasks should really aim to minimize potential negative impact on the product. Certainly, regardless of which of these operations or tasks it is, um, you know, implementing automation is certainly the correct decision. Um, but I think really it's key that the right automation with the right level of flexibility is implemented for that specific process and step. So if we think about unit operations where the product is actively processed in some way, so processing the start material, cell selection, expansion, fill finish, these operations really serve to reduce variability as you move through the process. And as we discussed previously, Given the variable nature of the start material, defining the time or specific conditions or a protocol in which this unit operation should take place is, is really challenging. And so really building in database flexibility into unit operations that will allow for correct process decisions to be made and um, based on the, the in situ state of the product. But if you think about what happens in those interstitial spaces between unit operations, the goal there really is to completely standardize those tasks and really minimizing flexibility and ensuring that you know you have that repeatable um, accurate processing in terms of moving fluid between those units operations and this is where i think you can you can implement task automation and reduce that variability in those failures next slide please and so incorporating flexible automation into units operations and, and standardized processing within task automation and really should be the aim when moving uh, manufacturing processes towards full GMP scale. But unlike uh, automation in other industries where you'd first define all the parameters and implement automation at a very late stage in order to 
perform the same process each time. Cell therapy automation strategies should be implemented as early as possible in the development process. I think certainly in the case of flexible automation anyway. Um, by doing this, I think you begin to understand all of the true variable inputs in the manufacturing process and really build in the relevant amounts of flexibility into each unit operation. Whilst on the other hand, locking down those task functions that exist in those spaces between each unit op. Next slide, please. So at Sexton, we've taken this need for flexibility within unit operations and the, the standardized need of task automation. And I'm really trying to bring those th two things together to come up with this new device. It's the, the Signal CT5. At the most simple level, um, the device is two pumps with a GMP batch record. Uh, it's relatively small. It can operate inside a, a, a hood um, or in a class seven, class eight environment through welding. It operates through a tablet um, using a commercially available user interface. Um, this can allow the pumps to be operated manually. It can allow you to build new protocols. Um, these protocols can be built and locked down as, as necessary. Um, and the consumables have also been designed uh, with maximum flexibility in mind. So we have a transfer consumable, which allows up to four inputs through uh, either a low connection or a sterile weld. We have a mixing consumable, um, so the mixing module, which you can't see here, actually sits on the left of the device that allows formulation. And then we have an output consumable, um, which allows you to fill five containers at a time with the, the next five sets of outputs and then being able to be welded on and filled and so on. Next slide, please. And so, as you can see, the device has been designed to allow it to perform both unit operations um, where flexibility uh, really needs to be maintained, but also act uh, as sort of a task automation workhorse. So being able to move fluids between adjacent operations in a, a standardized manner. But in terms of thinking about the CT5 from a unit operation standpoint, we recognize that a real industry need to implement flexibility into that downstream fill finish process. And so the CT5 can be used to simply allocate a product directly into final drug packaging. It can be used to formulate and, and subsequently fill into bags or alternative types of containers. Or it can even be used upstream. Um, you know, we often hear about um, high classification environments being used to formulate reagents and to you know, being able to bring those reagents together in a closed system manner with a batch record again potentially reducing that variability and, and getting that electronic batch record capture as we go forward next slide please thanks and so really embedding maximum flexibility into this um the concept of the ct5 really meant moving away from that typical razor razor blade approach um you know where technology provider develops a piece of technology that is exclusively compatible with their own consumables. And um, obviously from a business standpoint, that's completely understandable. From you know the industry itself, I think you know building that flexibility is, is key. And so whilst the CT5 output consumables are available with our own proprietary Celsius vials or with a range of pre-validated bags, there's also the option to create bespoke output consumables and um, with the manifold you can see on the right hand side there really allowing users to attach configurations of bags or vials that really best meet their processing need. And so from a unit's operation standpoint, the CT5 allows for maximum flexibility from a protocol and consumable point of view, but reduces that variability through accurate and reproducible filling. Next slide, please. So really ensuring accuracy during downstream fill finish unit operations is really fundamental to the, the success of the therapy. Um, manual fill finish um, introduces variables, obviously sort of inter and interoperator variability. And so really whilst it's easy to come to the conclusion from the manufacturing standpoint that you know, these variable fill processes might lead to an out of spec product, I think really, you know, and Dave sort of touched on it with the patient before sort of following um, following their therapy through a process. But sometimes I think we need to think about these from the business side. Um, you know, if, if the product is out of spec, it's potentially not eligible for reimbursements. Um, potentially many hundreds of thousands of dollars, but those, that's obviously going to have a significant impact on the business. Obviously, from the therapeutic side, it might be that a patient doesn't receive the correct dose. Perhaps the efficacy of the, the product is affected. So... Ensuring accuracy and precision during the final fill finish step is a really a critical part of the process and 
we've developed the CT5 to perform this unit up um, and really allow for that repeatability and accuracy um, whilst maintaining flexibility in terms of the process and consumables. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, just get back one. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, so just sort of following on from that, um, and thinking about how to control that variability in terms of um, accuracy and repeatable uh, fluid management between unit operations, I think it's fundamental that these processes are locked down through automation. So really ensuring that defined volumes are moved between unit operations A and B and B and C and so on. I think this then really ensures that that given unit operation begins with a defined volume and, and concentration. So again, you know, at the most basic level, the CT5 is, is two pumps and a batch record. And I think the flexibility of the consumables can allow for welding not only to output consumables such as bags, um, but also additional unit operations. And so the CT5 really has the capability to act as a task automation workhorse managing those fluids between those unit operations and really potentially closing down the cell therapy manufacturing process. Next slide, please. So um, in addition to really addressing the issues of repeatable movements of fluid between unit ops, um, really using the CT5 to further apply task automation in place of manual process and steps will, will obviously further limit that process variability. Um, so automating capture of GMP documentation reduces errors and deviations, uh, saves operator time and cost. Obviously, closed system processing can alleviate the need to work in those high classification environments, limiting the need for setup, teardown, lowering costs, as well as hopefully reducing failures. And really, you know, addressing these challenges have a number of downstream impacts. Um, obviously, from the therapeutic side, potential results in products of higher safety and efficacy, as well as reproducibility. And, from the business side, obviously, you know, we mentioned before, more inspect products, higher rates of reimbursement, and the higher likelihood of commercial success. Um, I think if we ever want to have ATMPs as first in line therapies, manufacturing reproducible therapies with high safety and efficacy and an appropriate cost of goods is a real priority. Next slide, please. So you know, one of the major challenges to overcome in, in order to meet those goals is the, the challenge of people, um, both in terms of direct cost and um, the cost of obviously retention and people moving between companies. So, you know, currently manual manual processes um, rely heavily on skilled operators to make that go, no go decision during processing. But the introduction of flexible, flexible automation um, reduces the number of operators required to manage a, a given manufacturing run. And, may allow for lower skilled operators to manage those processes and that really frees up those phd level scientists and highly skilled operators to lead those r d and, and process development efforts and the impact of this on the industry um actually could be quite significant so you think skilled operators are a real premium um in some of those selling gene hotspots like boston and california and often staff are trained up at very high costs only to move to a, a biotech or a cdmo across the street um, a few months later. So being able to rely on those lower skilled technical operators and a smaller number of them at that should reduce competition within the industry and potentially allow for higher staff retention and hopefully reduce the need for costly retraining on a regular basis. Next, please. So just to summarize, um, final slide. Um, so we're trying to at Sexton provide tools which address some of the challenges associated within the, the manufacturing of cell therapies um, with a view to improving efficiencies, reducing failures. And we have two main product divisions. Um, one of them is our, our cell therapy, uh, cell performance uh, product category, uh, which encompasses our range of um, human platelet lysates. The other is our process and handling solutions. Um, historically, the portfolio was based around a small volume, closed system cryogenic storage vial. And, over several years, we added additional supporting devices and RF sealing units, um, which allows for the use of the vial in an autologous or early stage setting. Um, an AF500 device, which is an AF, uh, sort of a high throughput fill finish device uh, for those larger scale applications. Um, and also obviously more recently, the Signata CT5. But I think the final thing um, I'd like to finish with really is that, you know, we're aiming to, be, uh, to develop products that 
um, really meet an industry need. And I think, as Dave touched upon it and, and Priya as well, you know, it's key that as tools providers, we understand the challenges that you know therapy divider, providers and CDMOs are facing. Um, and I think that needs to be the challenges of you know all groups at all scales and different stages of development. So I think the one critical element that really underpins the success of the industry and really allows for the, the manufacture of high quality um, products at appropriate cost of goods is that we all engage with one another and um, fully understand the challenges that we face and how together we can develop some solutions that enable all of us to hopefully move forward and, and be successfully at us. As, a, as an industry as a whole. Um, so I think with that, maybe a good place to start is with um, some questions um, that we've got five minutes left. So um, I can moderate those. Um, so one of the first ones that came in, um, what are the regulatory considerations around automation? So Dave, maybe you could take that one to begin. Yeah, sure. And I mean, we started very early on when we were thinking about this to actually go and have a, a meeting um, down at the FDA to get their viewpoint ideas, see what they're thinking around it. And, you know, in, in all regard, it's very positive. They're well aware of these issues <laughs> along with everyone else. And they're well aware that automation can play a, a key role in helping solve um, everything that you know, you've heard from the three speakers today. Um, it definitely the implementation the work behind it when you start looking at you know things like 21 cfr part 11 compliance you know what can you do within a, a gmp setting how do you validate verify what the equipment's doing things and a lot of the sort of the touch points right now in this industry where automation has to go hand in hand with manual work um so where are those trade-off where are the handoff points how do we control those so you know, I, I don't think there's anything that I see from a regulatory standpoint that should be um, a burden, a worry, uh, a bottleneck to adopting um, automation. And they're very much on board with it and very much want to see it. And I think it's on, you know, the tool and tech companies to ensure that the technology that's going out there is going to obviously meet the need both of the developers themselves, but also hit all of those uh, regulatory endpoints as well. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Dave. I think the one other element to keep in mind is around the software systems and the data management, right? And um, 21 CFR guidelines around that. If you think about it, even DocuSign, you know, has a whole process for validation and implementation. So just working with the, you know, if you're not developing the automation yourself, working with the the owners of the technology to understand uh, the package as a whole, I think is important. Thanks guys, yeah, um, I think that's, that's some good responses. Um, I know we're coming to the top of the hour, so I'll jump to another question. Um, so how does your manufacturing strategy, be it in-house or an outsourcing or hybrid model, impact the automation strategy? So maybe Pri, you could start us off with that one. Sure, so I think, you know, if you're planning to manufacture and do everything in house, then you have the luxury maybe of operating a little bit more in a vacuum because everything is under your control and you can put the personnel, the processes, the systems in place to approach that automation strategy and that technology as you see fit. Now, if you're outsourcing certain elements that include automation, such as either the manufacturing process or some of these, you know, like we said, in-process sensing technologies and or uh, even the analytical testing that you might do and you have to tech transfer to a CDMO, a CRO, or a CTO, um, in that case, you really can't operate in a vacuum and you have to think about the tech transfer elements to get that uh, over to your third party partner, but also in looking at partners, I think you have to look at what familiarity your partners or potential partners have with those platforms, those systems, automation, and whether it's something that they already have in house that would facilitate tech transfer, or if you're going to have to um, not only educate them, but perhaps even provide capital equipment. Great, great. Um, so maybe we've just got time for one more. Um, so I think we touched upon this a little bit in the webinar, but what consideration should be made um, deciding between a, an all-in-one automation um, solution and individual unit ops? And maybe I could just start off. I think, you know, Dave 
mentioned there about flexibility as the prayer, I think, and as did I. Um, you know, I think really establishing does that all in one unit up give you that flexibility? Does it give you the level of monitoring and control to be able to get the data um, to move things through a process? Does it actually do the whole A to Z of the cell therapy? If it doesn't, how do you bolt on in a closed system manner those upstream or downstream operations? Um, from a cost perspective, you know, does it make sense for you as a business based on where you are? Um, you know, you, you we know that obviously some people have um, you know experienced difficulties when there's been a lot of investments into you know infrastructure and materials and automation at a very early stage. Um, from a scale perspective, you know, will it allow you to scale to commercialization? I think Dave talked earlier about that one-to-one -one ratio of unit operations. Um, you know, if you've got a process whereby the majority of it is cell expansion, and you need to have a, a whole end-to-end -end unit op tied up for 14 days, or could you actually have individual unit ops and scale out on the, the bioreactor piece? So that's my thought, sort of thoughts. Dave, maybe you've got some other ones? Yeah, no, I think those things are all you know, extremely valid. I think, you know, when I look at it, I don't, I don't believe that there is anything in the market today that you can commercially buy that is an all-in-one end-to-end process. There's things that do multiple unit operations, but there's nothing that would allow you to hook up an apheresis um, and then have a bag, tube, bottle, whatever it is, of your final product in a freezer. And so if you're looking at a true, you know, end-to-end, -end, all in, you're doing that yourself. There may be elements that you can beg, borrow and buy um, from technology companies, but there's nothing out there that does that. And I think there's a reason for that, right? That we don't truly know what that is. I don't think that you can write down on a piece of paper what you needed it to do. And if you did, the specs and the design space for everything would be so wide that you'd be creating a ginormous piece of equipment with such advanced capabilities that it's going to take so much time, effort, cost, resource to get it there. So, you know, I think there's, there's a strong belief that I have that modular has to be the way until we know what we want. If you know what you want, and it's, you know, there are some processes that are very simple, you know, one day, probably not going to change too much. Maybe you are more locked down in your process, but I don't think for the majority of developers that are out there, um, there's really locked down enough or known enough that you can say, this is the way I'm going to do it. And I'm going to lock down absolutely everything and build um, a platform around it. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's companies out there that have tried to do it and there's companies out there that have failed to do it. Um, but I haven't seen any sort of successful all in um, piece of technology yet. Um, we're still in a learning phase together. Okay. Priya, have you got any thoughts to close us out? No, I think uh, I think you both covered it, and uh, nothing to add. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, I think we, we've just overrun on our time there. Um, so thanks to, to Dave and Priya for joining us, and thanks to everyone who joined the webinar as well today to listen in. I hope you found it useful. Um, there were some other questions. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to them. We'll try and address them. Um, in a follow-up, um, obviously you can connect with any of us on LinkedIn and reach out uh, individually. Um, but with that, we'll hand back over to the guys and facilitate. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, and once again, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all of the speakers. I think uh, we've covered some really critical points uh, today. Um, and I'd like to close off with a note that this webinar is available on demand. So if there's anything that anybody needs to refer back to, look out for the link to the recording in your inbox later today. Um, and to keep up to date on more resources and webinars like this, visit facilitate.co.uk or subscribe to facilitate exchange. And with that, thank you everyone and uh, have a good afternoon.